Hello, and thanks for joining me once again as I dive into the wonderful world of Azure Synapse Analytics. So, it's a bit of a beast. As you might have seen, it's got all these different parts to it. It's got the big Spark side, it's got SQL side, it's got orchestration. And so far, I've mainly just been digging into the Spark side. Because that's kind of what I do day to day. I do a lot of data break from Spark and building our lakes and all that kind of thing. So I kind of neglected the SQL bit. I was just thinking, well, you know, that's just SQL Data Warehouse, right? It's MPP, provision some compute nodes, spin it up, same old, same old. And it's not, because there's this new thing called SQL On Demand. So if I don't want to design a cluster and spin up this whole thing and pay per hour for the thing I'm using, I can instead just write a query and hit go, and that works. Um, and that sounds pretty cool to me. So we're going to have a look at that today. Going to have a look at first things first, where do you start with SQL On Demand, how do you set it up, which is going to be a very short part, and yeah, then what we can do with it. So let's have a look. Okay, so here we are. This is my Synapse workspace. Still spelled wrong. This is the one you saw me and no one told me, but I just spelled it wrong, so it's all good and I'm stuck with it. Uh, and then in data, you can see I've got some Spark databases. And yeah, that's, it, it, that is a warning sign, the fact that it's Spark databases. So I set up a logical database and I register a table and that's a, a hive metastore pointing at some parquet sitting in a lake. Why does it say Spark? So there's a definition problem between these are my Spark tables, these are my SQL tables, and I'd like to see it a little bit more central. I'd like to see just, here's a database. It might be Spark, it might not be. Who really cares? Because it's all data held in a lake. But that's not how it works, can This evening I will be drinking tea as we can. It's all good. Okay, so I've got some databases. I've got my linked lake. So I do have a lake set up already. And again, this is one I set up with just a load of data already in it. Now, for today's example, I've kind of set up a test area. Again, just address. I've thrown some park in now. I've said, give me some data I want to have a play with. Now, the way we were playing around before is I was writing a data frame. So I get something like this and just, just take a moment before we get into SQL pools to address how bad this is. So my language is PySpark. That's fine. It insists on putting the magic command in. We don't need that. Data path, fine. This is old school syntax. That should be nicely done. So, you know, we want to be spark.read. It's fine. Dot load is okay. We don't need any of this. Because what we've done is we've created signups with the lake as the root part. So actually, any time that we refer to a relative location, it's going to assume that's in our lake, and this is. So I don't know why I needed all of that stuff. And then we've got format at the end, which is it's fine. It's an old school way of doing things. So we can actually just do format there, makes it slightly more readable. So that's kind of me writing the same thing. Let's just pop and then out. Same thing. That's just code pedantry. It's fine. Uh, and what we'd normally do, you'd never write a query pointing at a single file. You point at a location, a directory, and say, just read that directory, tell me all the things you find inside there, and bring it back as a data set that I want to read. That's standard go-to I want to start. Um, and then what you then do is something along the lines of, you know, so data path, weird name for it, but okay. And then you'll create or replace temp view, give it a name, and then I can start writing SQL on it. So there is a SQL syntax, which is kind of create external table from location. Uh, the Python version, you have to do a little bit to then put it and say, here's a thing you can go and read. But it's, there's a few steps. So what we want to try and do is say, well, actually, what if we just ignore Spark entirely? What if we just want to say, I'm a SQL person, going to write some SQL? So firstly, setting up the Spark pool. I promised you. Um, you kind of you kind of don't. So by default, when you create your Synapse workspace, you've got SQL pools, and it'll have a SQL on demand, and it'll be online. It's auto sizing, and there's no config. I, I can't do anything here. It's just it's just there. It's kind of like the even if you don't design Spark or Warehouse or anything else, you get that. So that's nice. So if you try and define a SQL pool then it's talking about data warehouse units or dwoos we're talking about an actual sql data warehouse this is the big mpp cluster that charges by the hour and all of that kind of stuff so we're not dealing with that that's a different thing the sql pools 
So this SQL on demand one that's created by default is a different beast entirely. So whenever we're doing things, whenever we say, I want to use SQL, it's going to give us that choice. Are you using Spark pools on demand? Or are we using a full blown Spark pool, which needs scaling up, turning on, wait for it to start, and remember to turn it off, all of that stuff. So it's, there is that differential to make sure you understand. So let's go back. So what we're trying to do. So we want to actually understand this data. So if you right click, we've got this new SQL script. I can see a few things in there. So I can go, well, actually just query the data. And that writes a bit of SQL for me. And you can see it's automatically connected to SQL on demand. So by default, it said, oh yeah, you're writing SQL and you've not got a SQL pool. I assume you just wanted to run it for you. Um, I've got a database I can use, and it gives me the choice of all my SQL um, Hive ones, which is cool. Then select top 100 star from open row set, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I can, weirdly, I can hit, hit F5. I'm not used to hitting F5, I need to control enter, but it just works. And speed wise, so I was expecting the whole cluster starting, submitted query, 30 seconds, a minute or two. Um, I've been playing around with this and it, it just responds, which awesome, happy. Don't have to wait for a cluster to turn on and then I go make a cup of tea and then my cluster's turned off and all sorts of problems. So great, that is just, it's just on. Um, again, I was having a play going, well, actually, this is all useless, right? We saw with the other one that we don't need all this. But if I try and get rid of this, uh, you're going to not be surprised. It doesn't work. So I can't use relative addresses. So I'm trying to play all different kind of syntax, all different ways of doing it. I just, it can't find that local address. It needs that first bit, the HTTPS. And again, the HTTPS is a weird protocol for it to be using, given most things talk to data like store gen 2, which is what my core lake is, by the ABFSS protocol. So it's not using the data lake protocol when it tries to talk to it, which, again, fairly odd. Um, and again, we don't want to talk to a single file. So what we can do, we can just point it to the directory. I think that should work. Yeah, so there we go. Everything, everything comes in. Uh, and that's nice. I can also do wildcards globbing if you kind of use um, Hadoop syntax. So you can put in where wildcard starts with this, where it has this kind of path where you can tokenize things. That all works. So that's really, really nice. And then, yeah, I just, I've just got data, which is great. Weirdly, when I was starting off, you can't go to the folder and go give me that same SQL script. So that wants me to do a bulk load, which looks like it starts to do data factory things. Um, so I don't have the nice, just give me a nice, small, straightforward thing. I can't just query the folder, but I can pick a random file, hit select top 100, and just get it to do that, and then just remove the file name. That's fine, that, that, that works nicely. Um, so other things, what else can we do in here? Now the thing, I'm going to share my disappointment. I tried this earlier, it made me sad. What I want to be able to do, I've got all these Hive databases, right? I've, I've stored some data. I've said what I have. I the very first video, I brought in a couple of adventure works tables. The delta, the landed, I want to be able to query it. I want to be able to go, well, select star from, I mean, I'd like to be able to pull in, but I can't. Uh, base.dbo address, that kind of thing. Coming from base. Can't find it. Like to be able to right click, check out, and say new SQL notebook. Just, just go find that. Writes the query for me, automatically knows it's on base. And still can't find it. So it looks like that's planned. That appears like it's it's on the road. That's gonna be a thing that should work, right? Rent it to something in Hive, use a bit of Spark, switch over to SQL on demand and just query it and it'll work. Doesn't currently. So don't know what's going on, but hopefully we'll see that just one day get turned on. I think I mean, case sensitivity is a real thing, uh, and that no, it doesn't work. It's just, it just doesn't doesn't seem to be a thing. Um, could be maybe just pick the wrong thing. Yeah, it just doesn't seem to find anything that's sitting in there, which is sad. But again, we should get there one day, uh, and then it will all work. So what else do we want to do? Well. I mean, do you know any SQL developers that would be happy querying in this thing? For me, I love a good notebook. I'm happy writing notebooks. That's kind of where I do more work these days. But actually, almost every client I go to, 
they go, where do we write SQL? I'm like, well, just, just use a notebook, put it in SQL mode, and it's fine. And they go, can we use Management Studio or Data Studio or one of the other SQL IDEs? Um, and it's a little bit awkward because generally the answer is no. You know, you can have third-party ones that can query JDBC endpoints and all that kind of stuff, but just a the same SQL tool that you use to use your traditional relationship database, relational databases, you want to be able to use that. And most of the time you can't. So, good news. Uh, if I go back to the main portal, which I've left turned off, so I'm going to refresh, log back in. So back in the main portal, so in my advancing Synape, I've got these things over here. I've got a few different endpoints. So I've got a SQL endpoint, and I've got a SQL on-demand endpoint. So if I spun up a SQL pool, I connect to one place. If I just wanted to run some queries ad hoc on demand whenever I needed to, I've got a different place. So I can take that and use that as a server, as a destination. So Master Studio, here we go. Let's connect it up. So I can just throw that in there. Uh, I've set up a password when we created the Samus workspace. Click connect. There we go. Okay, so I've got access to SQL. So I'm using Management Studio. I can see a few different databases. So again, these are my Hive databases. Um, I don't think there's anything. Can I see the tables I've registered? No, okay. So it looks like kind of the, the syntax, they're not quite set up as proper SQL databases that I can use, but I can write a query. So I can go in and start typing. So let's do what we had in here. So I want that or some data back. So select top 100, it's got a HTTP reference, format parquet, give it a go. It's not complaining, but okay, got some data. So really, really quick, I can just jump in Management Studio, point at that endpoint, and remember I've not scaled the cluster, I've not decided how big it is, I'm not, I barely set up any user permissions, I'm just logged in, that's me, I've got access to that lake, and signups have access to that lake. So I'm not sure here whether it's connecting as me and using AD pass-through, or whether it's having the, um, the managed uh, identity of signups doing that connection, but either way, it's pretty cool that we can just go straight in. So that, that is pretty, pretty good. Um, what else do you need to do? So oh, I'd like to have a data, I'd like to save that. I'd like to have a database. Um, so we can do create database, let's call it SQL temp. Can I select? But is it going to run everything? It's going to run my one thing. No results to show. Okay, yeah, so it didn't bring back any results. So it's you can do selective uh, execution, which is nice. And then did that create me database? Cool, okay, right. So you can see I've now got this SQL on demand. So it's not even just a straight SQL pool. I've got a SQL on demand database, which is separate from my Spark databases. And then, ah, okay, so this looks a lot more like a SQL database as well. So you can see Hive, we just have tables. SQL temp, so this SQL on demand, I've got external tables, resources, views, scheme, and security. It feels a lot more like a traditional SQL database. Okay, so I can do that. So can I do a CTAS? Um, create table as select. So what is it called? Uh, DBO job address, and this needs to use SQL temp. Okay, so will that work? No, okay, so it doesn't like that syntax. Um, so I'm assuming that the create table stuff, um, I mean, so normally you need the, the whole kind of uh, parameters section at the bottom, which is the location, the data source, the file format, all of that stuff, which we've kind of already done in the open row set. So, I don't know how um, compatible that's going to be with a CTAS statement. I think it's expecting me to create an external table definition uh, rather than that. Uh, what I'd like to know is can we skip that and just wrap uh, a open row set in a view? Again, that might not work. No, I didn't like begin. Okay. So it's not traditional format. Um, that worked. Okay, so I can refresh that. Oh, and I have DBO address. 
So I can create a view. I can wrap my ro open row set in there. And then that's kind of like a quick shortcut external table straight into my thing, if that, I mean, <laughs> if it works. So I select star from TBO address. Picking up a data sense already, which is quite nice. I mean, SQL temp, so if I try that, I should get the, yeah, the same parquet right back. So I like, come over here again, so get rid of that. Mm, I'm in the wrong database, of course. So I can fix that. Hit go. There we go. Okay, right, nice. So actually, by creating a lot of these objects that are essentially just create views wrapped around an open row set, um, we can actually build up the same kind of things we do with an external table, but by skipping some of that syntax. Now, I might be, there may be some much easier way to do that. Seems a little convoluted, but to be honest, external tables have always kind of thought of as a view anyway, because the data is not held in the database, it's a view on top of some other data. But that's, that's quite nice. So we can do a similar kind of thing to what we do in Hive, in terms of build up this registry of all my different tables, except it's now in SQL and it's available through Management Studio, which is all of the kinds of cool. So that's great. Okay, so if that works, then we can actually set this up, have this running on a regular basis kind of to do it. We can probably see tabs from that view, I would hope. Uh, so can we do, uh, let's call it, DDL, because I'll be like creating a schema and call it my table address. So can we run that? No, okay, so it looks like the, the normal CTAS statement isn't quite happy. I mean, if this is a full SQL pool, we'll need to tell it the distribution, the index, it's kind of a lot more work. I was hoping we could just create that sort of thing, but then it's always gonna be an external table. So I'm not quite sure why you'd bother. The view's quite nice in that we could wrap that open row set with some, with some logic, with some transformation. We could define some views that are essentially, you know, you can do your whole data virtualization thing, have a layer of Parquet all set up and landed in your lake with folder level management and Spark jobs to do cleansing and handle JSON and all of that kind of stuff. And then just define some reporting objects as view layers on top of that Parquet and then have just tell your users to go nuts. Here's Manifest Studio, here's Data Studio, just query it. So that actually seems quite nice. That seems quite good. Um, having a look through the documentation, looks like the SQL on demand side is pay per throughput. So you pay per terabyte processed, not for how long the query is running, which kind of makes sense because I've got no idea if my cluster is on or off. I don't know how big it is. You've got no infrastructure to manage. I don't need to tell it how big to make this thing. It just runs. And I'm pretty skeptical, I'll admit. I thought it was going to take a while to bring back the queries and I'll be convenient at the price of wait time, essentially. But this seems really responsive. Seems really, really good at getting back to me and responding. So, all seem pretty good. So yeah, that is the initial little start. If you want to get started with Azure signups, you want to have a go at the SQL On Demand stuff, you literally just need to create a signups workspace that has some data in its lake and you can write SQL over it. Um, I think it's going to take a little while for us all to get used to this kind of open row set kind of functionality. That kind of, you know, certainly coming from a data frame thing, I'm Stockholm syndrome up to the fact that really easy, just write data frame spark dot read dot all of that. But syntax is a little different, it's very SQL but it makes sense. It all comes and queries my data. Um, what's going to be interesting is going into the Hive partitioning and the SQL partitioning. So I think that is probably something I'll try and do next and to see if we can do partition elimination. Because that's something that historically Polybase hasn't been great at. If you've got a SQL data warehouse and you say, select from my gigantic pile of Parquet, where year equals whatever, it'll, it'll read everything and then filter it when it gets into the warehouse. Um, Spark, not the case. It can do Hive style partitioning, read it and go, Oh, you know what, they're asking for this year. I'm not going to bother reading the data that they don't need. So we'll try that next. We'll see how that goes. And yeah, I hope you join me then. So thanks for watching. Let me know if you've got any questions. Anything you want me to look into, just give me a shout. Cheers.